Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Constance McIntosh, Acting Associate Director of the Dalhousie <coughs> Health Law Institute. So welcome to LASI. I am very pleased to introduce our esteemed guest, uh, Professor Jennifer Gibson. Um, she directs the University of Toronto's Joint Centre for Bioethics. She holds the Sun Life Financial Chair in Bioethics. And she is quite often called upon to bring her expertise to government advisory committees on policy development. One of her most recent engagements on this front was chairing a Council of Canadian Academies expert panel on the question of whether to permit advanced directives for medical aid in dying. And their report was released, I think, four weeks ago? In December. In December. Time is just flying for me. Um, so, before I turn the podium over to Professor Gibson, just a quick reminder of our format. Uh, Professor Gibson is going to present formal remarks um, until about close to 1 o'clock, uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions for some 20 to 25 minutes. And now um, I ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Gibson. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's great to see such a full room. And what's most exciting for me about this is that this is such an area where we're constant, we're continuing to learn. So I'm really hoping that it'll be a generative conversation. As much of less me, well, there will be me talking. You'll have to bear through that. But a lot of this type of talking, so that we can we can really learn about this area together because it is complex. It's important. Um, and I think, like death and dying, it touches all of us in one way or another. So in fact, one of the things that's really struck me, I've been working in this area um, since, uh, well, I guess actively in the policy side of things on medical assistance and dying since 2015, when I was invited by uh, the Deputy Minister in Ontario to uh, co-chair the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Group on what was then called physician-assisted death. And we've come a long way since then. Um, and of course, that, that ex expert advisory group was struck after the Carter decision um, when it came down and before Parliament actually pulled, its, pulled itself together to, to create, a leg create legislation. One of some of the urgency I think the provinces and territories were feeling was, um, at the end of the day, even though this was a criminal code amendment, provinces and the territories were going to have to put it into action in one way or another. And so they realized from the get-go it, uh, it would be advisable to try as much as possible to avoid a patchwork approach across the country. So um, all the provinces and territories, with the exception of Quebec, which had its own legislation, British Columbia that was undertaking its own um, sort of assessment of physician-assisted death at that time and participated as an observer, came together to develop a framework that helped to inform the direction of of, well, inform where we are now. Um, and of course, Bill C-14 um, took some of that, took some of our advice, uh, it rejected others. It also took some of the special joint committee's advice of the House of Commons and, and the Senate, um, rejected some of their advice as well, and here we are today. Um, opening up another uh, question related to medical assistance and dying related to advance requests. I want to loop back to this an earlier comment I made about um, this death and dying is a topic for all of us. And this has been one of the most interesting things for me working in the area of, of policy is that I, I've been able to work with a number of different institutions um, on, on government-related issues um, that didn't quite touch me the same way. Um, drug shortages are difficult. Resource allocation challenges are difficult. Pandemic planning is difficult, complex. But all of us are going to die. And so every panel I sat on, every consultation we did, every person I've spoken to, we are the topic under discussion as individuals and as society. So there's a certain intimacy about these topics, which is something I haven't encountered before. So let us just acknowledge that in, in our conversation today, that for some of us, this topic will be a little closer to home than for others. Um, it'll be a little more theoretical for some and a little very, very much a personal issue for others. So I'm hoping that we can create a space where there's room for all of these views, all of these experiences, and just honor the humanity in each other as we struggle to imagine what it would mean for us to die well in Canada in a caring society that supports that. So with those opening remarks, I do want to just make a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. 
Um, it's a real honor it's to, to be here. Um, when, you, when you look across the country and you think, where are the, the bright spots of scholarship in, 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 in areas that I work in? Here it is. This is like ground zero. So I'm so pleased to be invited to join you today. The second is to acknowledge the members of the expert panel, the Council of Canadian Academies, who I spent 16 uh, months with uh, working on some of the work that I'll be sharing with you today, each of whom was coming from a completely different point of view, a different set of experiences, and yet we were able to build friendships, and, and even if we didn't always agree. So that was a wonderful experience. And I do want to acknowledge, too, the research staff of the Council of Canadian Academies um, were instrumental, and some of the slides we've got were co-created uh, with them, so uh, I do want to acknowledge them. Um, so what I thought we might be able to do is um, the following. Start with just a, an opening definition, um, an exploration of what an advanced request for MAID is. I think you would all know uh, what that is, but I think it would be worth sort of exploring that a little bit. Identify its current legal status in Canada, and then I'd like to zone in on uh, some of the work, the mandate, and scope, and the process that the Council of Canadian Academies took in terms of its expert panel work with a focus on the work that we did as um, the Advanced Request Working Group. And then I'd like to, I'm um, suggesting that we conclude with an open conversation about, together, to consider what future implications were made. Um, this may have in Canada. So it, I really, I'm hoping it'll be a group participation at that point as we explore that. So one of the challenges that we faced um, as a working group um, with the Council of Canadian Academies was that we didn't actually have a working definition of an advanced request. It popped up in Bill C-14 legislation. It had been touched on as a concept in the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisor Group's um, work. We didn't name it an advanced request. We called it something else. Um, we also saw a similar concept raised in the Special Joint Committee of the Senate and the House of Commons and their recommendations, but we needed a working definition, and so this is the working definition that we, we um, had in our report, and it basically, as you will well, well know, it's an advance request for made is a request for made created by a capable person in advance of loss of capacity where that request would be acted upon in the future at the point where capacity has been lost. And so um, this was a starting point for our thinking because without a sense of the topic we were working with, uh, we couldn't continue. So I thought we might um, think about that, that definition in the context of ultimately people's <coughs> stories. In our report, we worked with vignettes, um, hypothetical vignettes, that try to bring um, the patient's story, patient experience into the, into the lens of the work we were doing. And so I'd like you to I'd like to introduce to you a hypothetical man named Mo, who is 86 years old and has been found to be eligible for MAID. Um, in the past year, he's been suffering a number of strokes, and he's concerned that um, although he's currently eligible for MAID, he might end up with, uh, suffering another stroke during the 10-day waiting period between his request and the and the actual administration of MAID that may prevent him from being able from from being eligible at that point to receive it. Now, um, his, his physician um, knows that current law allows him, the physician to be able to shorten that 10-day waiting period if there is an imminent if loss of capacity is imminent. The physician is actually not sure entirely whether or not it's certainly possible that a stroke may happen leading to loss of capacity, but it's not entirely it's not entirely clear that it is imminent. But moreover, and perhaps more importantly, uh, Mo has expressed that he would like to spend the time he has remaining with his wife. So he doesn't want to foreshorten uh, that that duration of time. He wants to spend that with his wife, and hence he is interested to create an advance request for made that should he lose capacity during that 10-day period, he would like it to be honored. And so on the eighth day of the waiting period, Mo does indeed have another stroke and lapses into a coma. And I'd like to introduce you to Vi. Vi is 89, and she was diagnosed with dementia at the age of 78. Shortly after her diagnosis, understanding that this was a progressive disease condition, she drafted an advance request for MAID with her family doctor, in which she stated that she would like to request her request to be fulfilled when she appears generally unhappy most of the time, when she no longer recognizes any of her friends and family, 
and is no longer able to perform basic tasks such as bathing or dressing. For her, her dignity is central. She's made it clear that she does not want to continue living in such circumstances when she can no longer look after herself or have meaningful interactions with her loved ones. While she was capable, she's reiterated this request with her family doctor and discussed it with her children. At the age of 89, Vi, who now lives in a long-term care facility, can no longer express herself clearly and is no longer capable of making decisions about her health. Sometimes she appears cheerful and content. Other times she seems agitated and sad. Vi's two children believe that she may be suffering, but are having difficulty determining whether her current situation meets the conditions of her, her advanced request, um, as, art as she's articulated. And moreover, her physician has since retired and she is now seeing a rotating number of physicians in her long-term care facility. So with these two examples in mind of people in circumstances where they may be seeking an advance request, I think we start to see where there may be notable differences between those requests that are perhaps legally salient, but certainly clinically salient, socially salient, and, and even ethically salient. And so part of our, our work was to try to untangle some of these. Um, and I think the key message here too, I would, I would like to suggest is that each person, if we sustain a patient-centered approach to thinking about medical assistance in dying, as is the aspiration I believe most of the country has, um, is a patient-centered approach means we need to reach the patient where they are. And so these two differences underline the different stories that may be associated with medical assistance in dying. And so when Bill C-14 was introduced, um, it, it was, I often frame this with my, my, my students, that it was aspiring to strike a balance between three ethical imperatives. Um, and some of these are stated in the preamble of the legislation itself. And I'll, I'll quote from the legislation, the preamble, Parliament recognizes the autonomy of persons who have a grievous and irremediable medical condition that causes them enduring and intolerable suffering and who wish to seek medical assistance in dying. And they also acknowledge, whereas uh, safeguards reflecting the irrevocable nature of ending, ending the life are essential to prevent errors and abuse in the provision of medical assistance in dying. So we've got respecting autonomy and something that's moving in the area of safeguards, protecting the vulnerability, even of those who, who may be competent in order to make such decisions. Uh, permitting access to medical assistance in dying for competent adults, the preamble continues, where their death is reasonably foreseeable, strikes the most appropriate balance between the autonomy of persons on the one hand and the interests of vulnerable persons in the need of protection and those of society on the other. And so many of the ethical questions that have surfaced in the, in the course that I teach on at Death and Dying seem to find in themselves grappling with how much weight ought to be put on any one of these pieces of the triangle. Now, of course, I'm not a lawyer. I, I don't, I'm not looking at this from, through the lens of, of sort of legal scholarship per se, but as an ethicist reading the preamble, I'm digging in there to find out what are the core goals that we might be aspiring toward, that we're trying to find a way to reconcile. We're not, we're not even going to square them because it's a triangle, but we're trying to find where the pressure points and where the tensions are. And so it's within this context we see the current legislation emerge, and I bet if we polled the room, we would have a variety of views on whether or not the balance has been struck the right way. But it's within this context, too, that we can explore advance requests for made. And so what we know is that in the current balance that has been sought within Bill C-14, advance requests for made are not permissible. And why? Well, if within the Bill C-14, there's a requirement that immediately before an individual receives medical assistance in dying, they need the opportunity to withdraw their request and to ensure that that individual has an opportunity to give, ex or is, does indeed give express consent to medical assistance in dying. And in many ways, this, this particular provision is, a, is an important safeguard for ensuring the, that we do promote autonomy within our legislation. We are ensuring that that individual does indeed want made, and we want to be sure that there's no, that they haven't changed their mind, that there are no other factors influencing this. So, you know, the balance is leaning towards autonomy by having this particular safeguard. Uh, but when we think about this from the point of view of, uh, when we think about this from the point of view 
of Mo or Vi, what it certainly means that the effect for Mo in his particular circumstance is that he really has is given two choices. The effect of this particular provision is that he must either take his chances and hope he doesn't lose capacity during the 10-day period, or if loss of capacity is deemed to be intimate, he must decide to receive May before the 10-day period is up, even if he should wish to live that 10-day period at the time he has remaining with his wife. And so it's, it is, in, in a way, perhaps for Mo, and it's felt this way, it's an impossible choice. A choice to, it's a, it's a choice of, of balancing different risks or different goals. Now, Vi, on the other hand, uh, for Vi, as soon as her dementia progresses to a point where she's no longer capable to make decisions about her health, Vi can no longer, she in effect no longer meets the eligibility criteria. So in, in many ways, this provision wouldn't even apply to her at all. So she hasn't even got, out, had, got past the gate she isn't eligible at this point for her to be able to even consent at the final at the final point. So their circumstances, both making an advance request, their relationship to this particular uh, safeguard within Bill C-14 is quite different. <coughs> so then we might ask the question, well, I mean, here we're talking about the issue of capacity loss. Is the law silent on capacity loss? And in fact, it's not silent. And here, as, as was noted in, in my description of Mo's situation, um, the, his practitioner uh, can, with, an, with another practitioner, um, so long as they both agree, can shorten that period of time, uh, that 10-day waiting period, um, allowing him to um, access made whilst he is still competent. And so that shortened time frame acknowledges that there may be situations where loss of capacity may be imminent, and so in order to ensure that an individual may access made and provide consent for it, then that 10-day waiting period must be flexible enough to permit someone to do so. Now, with that in mind, though, one of the challenges is there's, some, there's certain arbitrariness about that 10 days. I went back to the original draft of the legislation that was put out for consultation. How many days was originally proposed in that draft? Just out of curiosity, does anybody know? Except for Dr. Downey. <laughs> Throw it a guess. That was one of the proposals. It wasn't in the bill, but you're right, because that would come up in the Senate. There were some, some individuals who were making a pitch for six months. Right? The original, the original uh, draft of the bill that was made available for consultation was 15 days. 15, 10 days, six months, seven days, three days, four hours. You know, the 10, the 10 is a, a bit of a, like a, it's, it's a number pull, pulled out of thin air. But what is it aspiring to do? It is intending to ensure that you are not ambivalent about your choice. Not only that you have a chance to change your mind, but that you're not ambivalent. So, you know, there is this sense that there's something about the 10 days which has a particular purpose, which is to ensure that you have a chance to, you know, have second thoughts, but also to be able to reinforce your, your commitment to this particular course of action. But also at the same time, that 10 days is an arbitrary choice, right? It could have been longer, it could have been shorter, but here is where we are. Um, and so in the case of, you know, but nevertheless, it, in Mo's case, for sure, um, if it really he's, he's in a situation where he may be, because he is unable to, if he loses capacity in the current regime, he is unable to access made, then this would seem to suggest that he is left in a state of suffering. So if it is the case that, that he, I mean, if he's unable to access made as a means by which he may alleviate his suffering, then either his physician or his nurse practitioner must access other ways of mitigating his suffering, which he has already previously rejected, um, or he must be left in a state of suffering. Um, and so one of the things that, that is particularly rich and wonderful and also challenging about thinking about suffering is that it's subject of nature. And this is something that is, this is unique about our Canadian legislation in distinction from how sometimes suffering is treated in other jurisdictions. This notion that suffering is subjective, pain is also subjective. Our experience of pain is uniquely our own. You can find more than one person in similar clinical circumstances, both in pain, but the meaning they ascribe to that pain is very unique and unique to that individual. So the subjective experience of pain may mean that for, for this individual, 
um, we cannot, we, the, an objective assessment of, of pain becomes clinically difficult. And so our understanding of suffering is one that is seen through the eyes of the individual. So Mo has requested and been found eligible, which means his medical condition is grievous and irremediable. Hence, he is in a state at that time with the request of intolerable suffering, as he understands it. His suffering is intolerable to him, and it cannot be relieved under conditions that he considers acceptable. He may have declining, he may, for example, have declined continuous palliative sedation. He might have said, I don't want my family sitting vigil for 10 days as I slowly die. I prefer not to put them through that. Um, and so he has chosen maid instead. If he loses capacity during that 10-day period, his suffering may continue unabated. In other words, he may continue in a state of intolerable suffering until his death or be administered treatments that he's already rejected. Vi's situation, though, is interesting. Is she suffering intolerably? I mean, what we know from her particular case is that she's sometimes happy, sometimes happy and sometimes not. Is she suffering intolerably sometimes but not other times? Is she experiencing suffering, and is this suffering, um, is this suffering unique? So again, so suffering seems to be key, central to both Mo and Vi's experiences. But you can start to see how, in terms of assessing whether or not she is suffering, is this concordant with what it meant in her advance request that she is suffering? Raise may raise some questions for her, those who need to make the decision about what to do next. So. We find ourselves in a, in a situation in our current legislation where um, we know that the, the, the inability to have an advance request has real material implications for real human beings, real Canadians. But this is not purely the theoretical matter, it's not purely legal matter, um, but it really does affect um, people's life choices. And, and so this profound sense of we are ultimately, in talking about advanced requests, talking about people, is a hard place to be when you're developing policy. Because it, there are so many different lived experiences out there we need to be cognizant of. And yet, for the individual going through this, this is the only experience that matters to them at that time. And so uh, when Bill C-14 was introduced, uh, the, within the bill, there was a requirement that uh, following royal assent, no later than 180 days later, uh, the, there should be independent reviews or independent studies of three topics, of which one was advanced requests. And of course, the other two were uh, made in the case of mature minors, and the other was made where the request is um, on the basis of mental illness as a sole underlying condition. And that, in no later than two years after that, these reports, it says, in fact, one or more reports um, were to be uh, laid before Parliament. And so, at the time um, that this was, was announced, that, there, you know, that the bill came out and was subsequently receiving a royal assent, for all of us who've been working in the field, um, in one way or another, um, we're, pu we're puzzling over, so who's going to do these reviews? Who is, who, what organization, what entity, what group would have that independence that would allow it to be able to conduct a set of studies that regardless of where you stood on the spectrum of views related to MAGE, you might be able to say, ah, you know, that was, that was the right group to have done this. And many of us who've been involved in this, advocates or academics like myself, it, you know, the, the world starts to see you as, oh, you're on this, you're in this camp, or you're in that camp. And so that worry about independence was a ser ser serious one. This is where I thought it was a brilliant move, in fact, that the Council of Canadian Academies was tapped to do this work. Now, quite honestly, I didn't know very much about the Canadian Academies until they, until they were tapped on the shoulder. I knew of them. I knew that they were an independent science body, but I didn't know a whole lot about the work that they did. But it struck me that this was a masterful move in order to really provide um, sort of a, a real vote for independence um, in its review. So let me tell you just a little bit about the Council of Canadian Academies. So when we're talking about the Council of Canadian Academies, it is um, the founding academies were the Royal Society of Canada, which sort of covers off the social sciences and humanities, the Canadian Academy of Engineering, and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. And so the Council of Canadian Academies is an organization that's independent, it's not-for-profit, it's got its founding academies, indeed, who operate on its board. 
Um, but ultimately, what its role is to conduct um, science, uh, assessments, assessments of evidence in order to inform policy. What it does not do, importantly, it does not generate recommendations. So it looks what, at what's known or not known in um, relation to the topic, and of course that is comprehensive this, of the humanities and the social sciences and uh, the health um, and other sci sciences as well as appropriate. And to synthesize these by bringing together experts across the, across the country to systematically look at what the evidence currently is. And so Council of Canadian Academies was tapped by the, the federal sponsor, which was Health Canada and, um, and Justice, uh, to, as the quote here says, this was part of our charge to gather relevant information on the perspectives and considerations associated with these three issues, of which one was advanced request, and, and to produce reports that will ultimately inform dialogue. Uh, and that this should be delivered no later than the 14th of December for tabling in Parliament. Well, we delivered at the end of November, and it was tabled on, does anybody know the date? The 13th or something. 13th of December, right before the holiday break. But anyway, it was still on time as far as Parliament was concerned. So, so it was tabled publicly, and we released it at the same time. So I just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot of what the expert, um, expert panel process is because it is, is designed for, to be a deliberative process. It took, play, it took place over 16 months, starting with a planning meeting in, in January 2017, brings together a group of experts. Um, the experts then look at the available evidence through an extensive process of looking at the literature, gray and, um, and academic literature, international and Canadian literature is available. Um, process of six meetings during which time there's deliberation on that evidence to identify and to make sense of in, in the Canadian context what, what this means. These meetings, of course, were not just a set of six meetings. There was a lot of work that happened in between meetings where uh, panel members might work together to dig deeply into a particular area of expert area that they knew the evidence well enough to be able to synthesize and bring it back to their, their colleagues at the, at the table. Then there, there was final sign-off. So the reports that you have access to electronically are the state of knowledge that we got to by last August. Last August. And so, you know, that's, almost, that's six months ago. So it was really a green document. What do we know now? And, and again, also underlining that this was part of a ongoing conversation. Subsequently, we were able to present this to Health Canada and to, um, and then widely um, disseminate it. One of the key things, though, about this process, too, wasn't a bunch of uh, just Canadian experts with a few international experts as well. There was an extensive peer review process um, that involved multiple um, experts from around the wor world as well, mirroring the composition of our, our working groups in order to provide that real, really critical review to make sure that we were as balanced as we could be. We were covering off what needed to be covered, and they were, they, we had some 2,000 um, comments that we needed to, to work through based on that feedback. The other critical piece, too, although we, uh, part of our role was not to actively engage in public consultation, we did invite, call, we put out a call for input to some 500 organizations across the country who might have a stake in our deliberations, um, and we received 59 uh, submissions back which was um, some of those submissions were really rich in terms of providing a perspective, particularly from the perspective of those whom those organizations served, to give us more insight into more of the lived experience of, of, of Canadians at this point. And then our, there were three scholars on the expert panel who are Indigenous health scholars who also recommended that we hold an elder circle to gain some insight from some, elder, some of the elders from across the country, which we also did. And a key finding from that was that this was that there was a huge gap in terms of consultation and engagement with indigenous populations across the country around this issue. In part because it was lower priority given other urgent matters, but it was um, the beginning of a conversation that I think will need to continue. So that gives you a bit of a sense of, of what the process looked like. But our work as the um, as the advance request working group, there were 14 of us. Um, I chaired the group. We had two, uh, two researchers from the Council of Canadian Academies working with us, um, and also the Director of Assessments from the Council of Canadian Academy was my, my um, institutional counterpart. Uh, the members were clinicians, we had uh, legal experts, we had palliative care providers, we had oncologists, we had geriatric psychiatrists on that, that particular 
group, uh, physicians, nurses, people with, from social work background, mostly <coughs> scholars, policy folks like me, um, folks who are working very closely on the ground. And so the question that was posed that we were tasked with, what we used, called our charge, was that we were to look at, answer this question, what is the available evidence on and how does it inform our understanding of, made in the case of advanced requests, um, um, given the clinical, legal, ethical, and historical context in Canada. So we weren't just simply looking at what the clinical literature was saying. We were also looking more broadly to gain insight into locating this within the Canadian story. The Canadian story is our story. It's a story that we were accountable for, and so how might we best gauge that? An important part of our work was to understand and appreciate the context within which a conversation about advance requests for MAID was emerging. Um, what we noted was there are changing societal norms related to end-of-life care. Huge push over the last 15 years in terms of advanced care planning. The cancer care uh, system, systems across Canada have been tremendous in trying to develop tools and processes and supports for families, each one of us as individuals, to have conversations with our families about what our wishes are in general if we should lose confidence. It, be able to have those conversations so that those who may need to be making decisions on our behalf are, have the benefit of that insight about what our wishes might be. So we have advanced care planning that was really inviting uh, having these conversations early rather than in a moment of crisis. We also, um, in Canada, as we're seeing globally, are seeing an increase in the number of persons who are dealing with capacity limiting conditions, increase in, in dementias. And I'll, I'll, you know, I will share with you that um, that's affecting my own family story. So my father is, has moderate dementia, he's in long-term care, and so it's been interesting as part of this work to be watching as a family member concurrently walking that journey alongside of, of under, exploring some of these topics together. So this is something that is a topic of discussion in a way that I think perhaps has been a little bit submerged but now is much more open what, to, what dementia means, but it's also associated with that. There's often a lot of stigma too that, that surfaces. And then finally, the reasons why somebody might seek an advance request uh, really turns on, I think, an increasing attention to empowering patients to make choices about how they want to die that we see. Um, and we see that both in the clinical, uh, from a clinical perspective, certainly the legal perspective is certainly reflected in our current MAID legislation, but also just from, from Canadians saying, this is, this is a meaningful moment for me and my family. We'd like it to be meaningful, not purely a clinical matter, not purely an institution matter. We'd like to have some control over what that actually looks like. So that context was important for us. But we were also asked to consider, interestingly, and, and I'd love to go back through our notes to find out where this uh, ended up in the charge, but the charge was, what are the unique considerations in addition uh, that uh, ought to be taken into to account depending on when an advance request is made? So, and it's specified. So this was the charge that was coming from our federal sponsors. The charge included before a diagnosis of a serious illness. Uh, considerations that may pertain to after a diagnosis, but before onset of suffering. And then the third would be after all the eligibility criteria and procedural safeguards have been met, except for the 10-day waiting period and the reconfirmation immediately prior to provision of MAID. So you could see Vi is, is, would be, right now, she would fall in, in this scenario of number two. She has a diagnosis. We know that to, uh, the dementia she has is progressive. It is life-limiting, not just capacity-limiting. Um, but she, at the time that she drafted her advance request, she was not at that point suffering intolerably. And, we're, and her, her family is trying to ascertain, is she now suffering intolerably? So they're not sure whether or not she's eligible. Yeah. Whereas Mo, over here, is, has been found eligible in all respects, if, except but for this worry about that 10-day waiting period. So with, through the use of vignettes, we worked through each of these scenarios to try to understand what are the key considerations that ought to be brought to bear. Um, and so what evolved was sort of a, a framework for, think, for our own work, for thinking about this. There were some three key considerations, or sometimes uh, members of our, our, working, our panel uh, working group would talk about this as areas of risk or areas of uncertainty 
Um, and so all of that, all of this language, depending on what felt most comfortable for members, would, would come up. But there would be concerns perhaps related to the status of the patient. Uh, for example, um, where the patient is in their tra disease trajectory, early or late. How much insight do they have about their disease at this point? Early in the disease, it's a little more open. Further down that journey, you have a pretty good insight about what this looks like. Um, the extent to which there's alignment between the present uh, physical or emotional state of the individual um, and the concordance of that state with what might be written in an advance request. Uh, the currency of their expressed desire for MAID, where somebody still has some uh, confidence, are they reiterating that? And the circumstances, um, in particular, details related to the circumstances about what constitutes intolerable suffering for them. Uh, there are also considerations related to communication. The extent to which um, the, w those circumstances of intolerable suffering are indeed clear, if they are consistent, if they're persistent, and so is there consistency that we actually have good insight into what those um, particular circumstances might be? And then the third speaks to relationships, recognizing that if somebody has lost capacity to make such decisions, then someone else must be the one who, who honors that advance request or d identifies when and um, when that advance request ought to be um, honored. And so these relationships, these third parties, um, do raise questions about the extent to which they are familiar with or understand enough what that advance request is speaking to. So with this framework in mind, this, the uncertain, we noted that depending on the individual and their circumstances, this was, these sort of dimensions could be intersecting at times. They could also be on a continuum. Somebody might at one point be, uh, there may be a great deal of clarity, or there may be a need for greater clarity, and that could be sought if, if early enough along the way. And so this sense that these were important dimensions that could contribute to, on the one hand, the degree of certainty or uncertainty with, res with respect to whether or not the, um, the desire for made was consistent at the point at which it might be administered. So we were curious to know then was, okay, that's sort of the, uh, that's a bit of a framework for thinking about these, the key considerations of how they may intersect in particular cases. What do we know about the Canadian evidence? I mean, you look to, what do we already know? It's not creating new knowledge necessarily, but what do we know? And so one obvious place to look was to see how, uh, how this advance request were made was similar or different potentially from advanced directives. Um, and so this was one of the things we were asked to consider. If you look across the country, there's a lot of variation across the country in how each province and territory uh, administers an approach to advanced directives. Some are proxy directives. For example, in Ontario, um, it really turns on uh, the substitute decision maker who has been identified either by law or by the individual um, as by law, what to be the one who makes the decision in accordance with the patient's wishes. Others, for example, my family in Alberta, uh, they have on record um, what their what their advanced directives actually are, and with as much specificity as they possibly can. And so this variability um, was something that we noted. The other is that advanced directives are not specific to end of life decisions. They are specific, they, they can apply to any sort of decision that might involve you losing confidence and unable to make a decision at that time. That may be temporary. temporary. Um, and so advanced directives are a much broader net um, than, than what we were talking about in terms of advanced requests. It's an open question whether or not we might be able to see a regime that includes advanced requests within advanced directives, but I'll leave that open for, for now because another material co consideration is that medical assistance in dying is the only um, end-of-life um, end, end decision that is actually, well, I, 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 Dr. Downey will correct me if I overstate this, that, that is, is captured within the criminal code. I mean, you can see negligence and so on, but this is a very specific type of um, clinical interaction, which is governed by the criminal code, whereas advanced directives are not. So um, we also saw across Canada, there is increasing use of advanced directives in some form or another, but it's, it's still an area of a practice that is, is emerging. It's not consistent. Um, and many um, clinicians will report how difficult it is to be consistent, to comply with an advanced directive if there's tension with families or if there's discordance within families about what the, the steps might be. So in practice, it's often hard to achieve. But nevertheless, what evidence there is seems to suggest that um, advanced directives have a positive to neutral effect on treatment decisions. It's not harmful. Maybe it's neutral. 
and sometimes it's positive. So, you know, interesting. I think, you know, it's sort of flagged for us, more work needs to be done in advanced directives, period, um, let alone in advanced requests specifically. So then we wanted to understand, well, okay, guess what? We've got two years experience with MADE in Canada. What can we learn from, from that experience? And we know that the federal governments and the provinces are collecting data to ascertain the extent to which there's compliance with the current legislation. But what really matters in many ways um, for families and patients is the quality of the experience. A patient is experiencing their dying process as a seamless process. They're not parsing it into, oh, this is a criminal code adjudicated made thing, and then there's this other set of decisions. From their perspective, it's actually probably part of a continuous experience in general. So that it really calls on the need for more research in that particular area. But the area that we do know from some of the research there were a few studies that, that took place before Bill C-14 came into place, and it was around the time they, was, uh, they were contemplating whether or not MAID should be permitted in Canada that showed that, that again, given the concern that people might change their minds, um, that there was a sense that people had continuity in terms of, or there was a high level of preference stability over time. If you thought euthanasia would be an op option for you or MAID would be an option for you, um, the patients in these studies were consistent over time and very rarely would decide otherwise. In the more, in the, in the intra-made uh, period, um, a colleague in, colleagues in Quebec have been studying uh, from the perspective of de uh, persons with dementia, caregivers, formal, informal <coughs> caregivers, and patients themselves, but what their perspective is on the possibility of an advance request for made, and some of the early findings um, indicated that in fact there is, um, that there are there's moderate to high support for the use of advanced requests in the case of dementia. And when I say moderate to high, it depends on the situation. So there would be you know, 60, you know, 50 to 70 percent support amongst nurses and caregivers for um, the use of advanced dementia in the case, or advanced requests in the case of an advanced stage of dementia. But that percentage increases significantly um, when somebody is at the terminal stage of the, of the disease. Now there are. I know that there's some finding that are, findings that are coming out that are coming from the speaking from the voice of persons with dementia to find out their views, and I don't know that that has been published yet um, from the patient's perspective. But we're we're waiting to see what those findings are. So again, the, the, what we found was there is evidence, but there's not a whole lot of evidence at this time that we can really draw from. But it, it sends some signals, um, useful signals for us. So we turned our attention to the international evidence, which we, which of course, if you remember with Bill C-14, or actually the Carter decision, looking to what other jurisdictions were doing, uh, provided some confidence that Canada could enter into um, a policy approach to medical assistance in dying that could have the assurance of safeguards to mitigate some of the concerns that had been raised about possible abuses or risks associated with it. So it, it seems reasonable that we'd look at an international experience to see in jurisdictions where advanced requests are, are permitted, uh, what do, what is, what's their experience like? And so Belgium and Luxembourg, and, and I would say the Netherlands, they, they don't talk about advanced requests, they talk about advanced euthanasia directives. And so in that context, Belgium and Luxembourg do allow advanced euthanasia directives, but only when the person's irreversibly unconscious. Um, so what we know, uh, what we have available to us are not so much the story of each patient who became irreversibly unconscious, there is some numeric data available to us. How many people actually um, had a euthanasia act, uh, had a euthanasia directive, um, and who had that um, was saw that used in the case of irreversible consciousness? And in fact, Luxembourg has only had one reported case of having used it. So it's in the it's in the books, but it, it's not actually being used that often. In the Netherlands, um, the Netherlands understanding of um, of suffering and the, the importance of it in the due care criteria for the clinician, the physician, to be able to assess the suffering of the patient means that the patient must have some level of consciousness. So that's a material difference between these approaches, and indeed they do permit advanced youth, youth, euthanasia directives. And so it was very difficult for us to get our hands on uh, some of the data related to this because not all of it is reported. We don't have, they don't report the list of the number of people with advanced euthanasia directives, but they do report the number of people who act, received an assisted death uh, who had <coughs> dementia as a concurrent condition of some kind. 
So looking at those cases of persons with dementia, 16, over a period of about <coughs> seven years, uh, report, were reported to have had an advanced euthanasia directive and to have had lost the competency and to have received an assisted death. Four of those proved to be controversial, in large part because uh, there were questions about the, the physician's due diligence in terms of ensuring that this was the patient's wish. There was sort of lack of sort of due diligence ensuring that there, any uncertainties were sought to be addressed, either by consultation with other clinicians, um, or where there seemed to have been some behavior around that time to suggest that, the, that perhaps the patient did not actually want that type of intervention. But 12 of them, out of the 16, did meet the due care criteria. So, you know, it, there are some of the controversial cases um, really sort of signal that there is, it's often hard for those who are making these decisions to figure out, have we got, is it the right time? Have we got it right? So uncertainty about the patient's desire for euthanasia, communication, and relationship with the patient, physician, echoing some of what we were seeing in our case studies, signaling where the work would need to go if, in, indeed, in Canada, such were introduced. So um, we might think about then, so what would be the potential impacts of introducing advance requests for MAID in, in Canada? Obviously, uh, there's a strong argument to be made that this certainly reinforces and bolsters a commitment to autonomy. Um, second, uh, we've heard, especially from some of the call for input, we heard from average Canadians who were submitting letters to uh, Dying with Dignity, 600 and some letters telling their stories. Um, that sometimes just knowing that there was an advance request was an ease of suffering. It eases our mind to know that if I lose my capacity consent, then I will at least know that my wishes will be uh, adhered to. But it also be, may relieve suffering because it means that somebody is not in a protracted period of intolerable <coughs> suffering and can have that alleviated at the point where it is intolerable, even if they are not competent. But it does also, um, unlike in the current regime right now, where it really falls on the individual to make that choice about whether or not they're, uh, even right to the very end, about their, um, whether or not their decision ought to be made. This does bring in other parties. Um, it would bring in other parties that there, were, there may be a felt burden. And I was asked recently, just uh, for a media interview, whether or not this heavy burden um, what, what I thought about this heavy burden. And I think in, in any of us who've ever had to participate in a decision about a loved one in an intensive care unit knows that you may know what the right thing to do is, but it's sure hard to make that decision, that you're actually grieving the loss of a loved one. It's emotionally burdensome. That's the nature of those decisions. Um, and so some of that is unavoidable. It will be unavoidable. And sometimes anecdotally we'll hear from, from families who have been with their loved ones during the um, receiving, who was receiving maid and saying, it was such a relief for us. So there's a real variability in terms of the experience of, of the third party who might have, a, have be participating in this. But there may be differences between clinicians and with, um, and with family members, not least of which that for clinicians, there's a real urgency to get it right. Uh, because of the weight of the law that's behind them if they get it wrong, right? So just sensitivity to that burden that may be there. Um, we heard quite a bit, and I think this is something that it's worth keeping in our, our eyes to, is that um, we talked about individuals. I've talked about individuals a lot here, too, uh, today. But um, there are, we, as I mentioned very early on, there's often quite a bit of stigma associated with capacity-limiting conditions whether that's due to brain injury, whether that's due to neurolog progressive neurological condition, dementia is an example. And so uh, some niggling worries amongst some panel members um, and in some of the literature about what the introduction of ad advanced requests might do in terms of reinforcing, potentially reinforcing some of these stigma, uh, some of the stigma or sort of negative perceptions. Um, and uh, just sort of a, a flag that, that, that that's society's interest to ensure that we, we do have a caring society that doesn't leave some, some of those behind just by virtue of their group membership. And then finally, recognizing in Canada there are constraints on resources and a real worry that somebody might seek to um, have an advance request. We've heard a few cases like that in the media uh, because they can't otherwise have their, their needs met even though the resources are there, they can't access them. So access to resources may be become more of an issue rather than less. And so this signal that if we're thinking about safeguards, and we've been asked to consider safeguards, we really needed to think about this at two levels. Case specific, the individual, and system level. So uh, canvassing the evidence that we had before us, um, we identified both 
legal safes, well, we identified three types of case-specific safeguards, legal safeguards, refining the criteria for eligibility criteria for access is may be important. We may need to think about what that would actually look like. Clarifying the role of the substitute decision maker or the third parties making these decisions. That it is not their values that ought to inform this, but others, and that's a struggle that we, can, we already have. There may be creation of a registry where I can put my advance request somewhere that is accessible by my clinician, even if my clinicians change or my family needs a quick reference to it. Uh, there may need to be time limits on validity. In Belgium, it's five years. Is five years too long for a, uh, an advance request to be valid, or is it, or do we need something that's shorter? So that's a, that's a possibility to think about. You know, the setting limits means that somebody could have changed their mind, but if the paper from five years ago is the one that stands, they may in, inadvertently be receiving made they don't want. And then third party neutral assessments of the advance requests, so that there is sort of a, a assurance that the advance request was developed well with the right type of content. Clinical uh, safeguards, so counseling for both clinicians and for the families in the process of developing an advance request to ensure that they're informed, aid in drafting them. And then support for patients, caregivers, and professionals. Um, understandably, clinicians are worried about doing this well, right? They want to make sure that they do this well, so what kind of training and support might be required that they don't already have? What sort of emotional support may be required, um, which may just sim be simply being a debriefing after um, uh, or something a little more intense than that. Um, and also, just more generally, supports for end-of-life decision-making, which is often difficult. We hear often clinicians struggle with transitioning a conversation from a conversation about treatment to a conversation about palliation and quality of life. Or, and then from there, quality of life to the limits of what is possible. And then at a system level, the urgency of ensuring that, we, that whatever contribution and advance request uh, regime might offer that it is it fought, continues to foster um, and engage um, advanced care planning in a way that serves us all. Um, that concurrently we see improved palliative care education and support and broader palliative care approaches. And indeed, one of the things in palliative care right now is there is movement towards early palliative care. You may be in the course of treatment for a disease and receiving palliative care at the same time, because your quality of life, your whole the meaning associated with that whole journey is as important. So we're seeing that more, and, and so some reinforcing of that. Systematic data collection um, for quality insurance. A colleague, um, one of our, our panel members, um, uh, Harvey Shipper, noted uh, to, to me, and, and, I, and I share it with you, and I'm sure he'd be very comfortable with me sharing it with you as well, is this is a social innovation. You know, doing this is, is, is a material change in the way in which we provide care in Canada. Uh, we wouldn't. We we got. We keep a really close eye on surgeons innovating in surgical suite. So why aren't we providing the same level of attention to the quality of that experience out now and learning from it intentionally from the very beginning? And I think the research community and a lot of the practitioner side part of the community has been attuned to this. We we get a little bit of mixed messaging from government um, on this as well. But uh, indeed, oversight and monitoring are critical safeguards. So where we summed up, and I'll just, these are final thoughts of the panel, were just to remind ourselves that removing a requirement of both final consent raises the possibility that somebody might receive MAID who doesn't want it. It's possible. Um, and the key issue is really turns on this uncertainty about when and whether conditions of a patient's advance request have been made, which really pointed to the, the reasons why some of the key considerations in that emerging framework that emerged started to identify where those areas of uncertainty might be and potentially even if this were to be introduced into Canada, where some efforts related to safeguards might be. Now, we, I will say, though, there were a number of panel members who um, were really concerned that no amount of safeguards will be effective to mitigate the risk of somebody receiving MAID that they might not otherwise have wanted. So even questions around effectiveness of the safeguards and indeed, it's a policy choice. It's a Canadian's, you know, a weighing in type of choice about what sort of risk we might be willing to take. But also recognizing that some of these choices are being borne by individuals. And so there's some sensitivity that we may not know if it's effective until we've actually tried it. So that in, that's where the social innovation comes from and some of that risk as well. So here's what I'm, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to leave it here with you. And so what I'm, the last thing I thought we might be able to talk about together was the so what? So what are the future implications of this um, that are coming, coming to mind for you? We certainly found that one implication for us, and I'm very aware of this, 
is that we have knowledge gaps we need to fill. That's even in our current experience about medical assistance in dying. And the research community needs to show up, and the research funders need to show up to do that work. So there's bits of work that many of us may, may need to do. There's still advocacy work to be done in terms of ensuring good quality of care across the country, at, regardless of whether or not an individual should choose made or not made. But then for those who are advocating, who may advocate for advance requests, there's a lot of work there to be done too in, in, in order to do that. And then for governments who are accountable for the delivery of such, such care, they're, ma they're continuing, I think, implications for their role in ensuring that we're keeping an eye on quality and equity and the total experience in a way in partnership with civil society, in partnership with researchers to do that well. So those were a couple of the, a few of the ones that are sort of burning for me in terms of future implications, but I'll leave it there and I will hand it over to you to weigh in with what you see as some implications from, from where we are today. So I'll leave it there. So first of all, I have the applause. <laughs> open up the floor. Yes. I have three ideas and expressions okay. learned from our experience uh, that I'd like the future lawmakers in this room, if I just ever have to work with someone who's in the depths of a very serious progressive illness to consider. And, and one of them, if I gave an example, is my father has eight sisters. And if he were to collapse in a coma tomorrow, yeah. and he said, no, I'm in a coma more than three months, he wrote down on a scrap of paper with his diary, and so let me go. And we've got four sisters that say no, and the four sisters that say yes. We could tie the legal system for years. Yes. So I'm wondering if in making these policies, say if I were to write my own advance directive, would I be allowed to include a clause that says no one else can undermine this directive, not my child, not my spouse, not my siblings, not my substitute legal caregiver? Is that going to be considered? That I guess what I'm trying to say is the medical institutions are really only now coming around to the idea that is, it is my right to decide what is my acceptable level of mm -hmm. suffering when I've had enough and when I want to go and how I want to go. But our doctors are trained to guard life at all costs. It's, it's their mentality, it's what they've dedicated a decade of training to. And we now have the technology, and this is where it really gets blurry, mm -hmm. especially for people that aren't really savvy with a lot of medical technology. We can keep people going for decades on machines. But is that living? And, and the medical institution has to get their head around and away from the opinion of treatment at all costs because it is my life and my death. And no one else should have the right to decide that. And um, I also work in psychiatry, so I, I want to really put this question out there that's based in part on a groundbreaking case that came from, I believe it was the Netherlands, correct me if I'm wrong, about a very young woman. She was finally about 22 when she was given um, legal euthanasia, who had suffered intractable depression her entire life since childhood and begged the government to euthanize her. And they said, no, you're young, you can be treated, you're physically apt. And, they said, and she said, no, I'm done with this. I've been dealing with this since I was seven years old. I'm done. They finally gave her a new euthanization. The thing that I want people to uh, consider when you're working with someone who has a mental illness, especially say one with severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar, when they are in a crisis, they're not capable of giving consent. We know that. But keep in mind, when they are medicated, and stable, and they say that I am sick of, in and out of hospital all the time, I'm sick of the medications bankrupting my family, I don't want to do this anymore, please listen to their opinion, because just because they're not capable to have capacity all the time, doesn't mean they don't ever. And we tend to sweep over the broad brush that going to see a friend you can't possibly have any uh, legitimate legal opinion, and that is completely wrong. And keep those in mind. That you're dealing with 
in person and what their decision is on how to go. It's like my doctor told me, she said, doctors cannot stop people from dying. But she said, we can make the transition easy. And I think that's what my family culture in Canada has to get ahead of. Thank you for those reflections, and I think they, they echo um, I think you're not alone in, 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 um, in some of what you've just shared. And some clinicians are also on, on, are with you on this. They, um, I think some of the, the opportunities that we see, particularly let's just start with the first, is um, I think one of the reasons why the introduction of advanced directives across the country um, is, is an opportunity for all of us, is that if you get to designate who your decision maker is and if they understand what matters to you, um, then that is one way to, to try to manage that sort of divide four sisters and four sisters. Who's the, who's the decision maker? It's not, it's not like a majority, it's not a democracy at that point, right? And so um, I, I think that's where there's been some real effort to really, really empower each one of us to identify, so what are your wishes, but who do you trust to speak for those wishes? So that if you're not able to do so, they will do that. But, but I think what your example underlines too is that um, the person who has that role, what is in, described often as a sub proxy or a substitute decision maker, it's not substituting their values, they're, they're actually speaking through your voice in terms of your values. Um, but they also need support around them to be able to be that voice with you. And so that's where sometimes the family dynamics can really create a, a big challenge for that individual, even with ones designated to that particular case. Um, the clinicians, too, I mean, it's, this is really, I think what it really underlines is that end-of-life care is not a technical matter. It's social. And we, there, are, there are overlapping relationships. There are ways in which clinicians are trained, and it depends on which, which discipline you are, too, right? So I've got colleagues who work in intensive care units, and they, they are, they're, actually, they're actually more attuned to, the, you know, they need to have the conversation to say, we cannot do anything more. We think we need to talk about um, other options. For, I think it's not just palliative care, but we think your loved one is is on a trajectory towards death, and we, we're hurting them now with the technology. Whereas I think other professions, like in, in oncology, there's that real struggle. And I think probably you're, you're seeing it in psychiatry, too, the struggle with there's got to be something more. So there are cultures that exist that, kind of, that any one of us as patients bump up against, and we don't even know it's there, but it's that milieu that sort of fosters certain directions. So here's my hope. My hope is that... Um, as difficult as some of these types of conversations are about advance requests are made, if they can peel back the veil around some of these, some of what you're describing, bring a fresh light to them, allow us to revisit these, allow us to, and you see this in um, some of the way in medical schools now are saying, we need to revisit our curriculum. We need to be, we need to be thinking differently about how we train clinicians to have these conversations so they're not avoiding them. Or we also, though, need to be thinking to about what is it that you or I might need as a substitute decision maker to make sure that I feel as comfortable as possible making this that I, you know, it's a moral duty, right, that I'm assuming when I, not a legal one, well, it is legal uh, in certain cases, it is a moral duty, too, that I want to do right, I'm, my moral responsibility for you, my loved one, and so what are the supports we need there? So, you know, it's... Um, I'm not sure that we're going to resolve this overnight, but that if, if here's my wish that a conversation about MAID um, will actually serve to foster a refresher conversation about these types of decisions in general, I think that will have been a huge benefit for us um, as Canadians. And we need to continue, regardless of where you sit on the MAID topic, continuing driving the, the need for such conversations because we're talking about human beings and their suffering. And a caring society is one that seeks to alleviate that and to acknowledge that for each individual, it is individual. So, I mean, that's, that's not much of a, it's just a reflection back on what you were saying, but I, I'm with you on it. Other, uh, yes. Hi, um, my name is Anne Christie. I um, don't miss the one we have in Holland. Um, the physician, no, your physician. Yeah. This is what you could look into which is very serious, not so much for my age anymore, but for the younger age, Yes. I doubt anybody in this room has had a physician for the last 40 years, the one, one and only. Yeah. I'm on number seven. 
I have all my papers filled out yeah. that they are my kids and we, but I'm going to do everything in hunky dory. Yeah. But the fact is, at the last doctor I went to, what country, doesn't matter, but I'm saying he says, that paper that in, in my, you my file here that you gave me, yes. I'm never going to be looking at that. So where do I yeah. go then? But your responsibility is, is in the government to give people, to give province of Nova Scotia especially, more doctors so people and families can go to at least one or two doctors so they get to know that. Because yeah. if you go down complaining to your doctor every week about every little thing, if I were a psychiatrist, I would say, hey, it's a red flag. Access resources. Access resources, yeah. Yeah. A lot of problems are having trouble with that. Yeah, I think a lot of problems are really struggling with that in certain parts of the country, in northern areas. And I mean, you're seeing a real move towards how can we better bridge clinicians with, with wherever Canadians happen to be, and they're using virtual care for that. But there is, it, we're, what, what comes with that is we're losing. It's important because it's a way to convey information and knowledge to support people's treatment decision making. But we're losing that human connection, which, you know, 40 years of having the same GP who really knows you well, saw you through your ups and your downs, is going to have insight that many of us don't have. Um, and at the same time, so uh, the other part of my life is looking at um, ethics and social issues related to artificial intelligence. And um, some of the, so this sort of underlines some of the risks, the more that, so the, we lose the human dimension of this and it becomes more of a technological matter than you having a document in your file ceases to tell your story. It's just a document. One of the, what we know about, for example, informed consent, informed consent's not a document with a signature. It's the conversation, it's the deliberation, it's the reiteration, it's the human interaction it's the, that really, really matters. And so, um, I take, I t you know, I, I agree with you. We need to, in, in training of clinicians, in creating health systems that continue to foster that, we don't lose that. We can't lose that. Yeah. So one of the implications that, that I see is, we talk about doing these advanced requests and doing like if and then statements. If yeah. I can't recognize my family. If yeah. I can't form a sentence. Mm -hmm. but. When you talk about people with dementia or those types of, and even mental illness, yes. how do you define not recognizing your family? Like today? What about tomorrow? What about if you recognize them again tomorrow and then you forget the next day? And, and so I worry about those if and then statements actually being concrete enough to m make the decision that that line has been crossed. Right. Because it, 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 it's going to go back and forth all the time. and. It's, it's not really, you, it would take a very long time to properly kind of define those <coughs> just from a policy perspective to meet yeah. all of those requirements. It would be very difficult. And that's one of the issues that I kind of see with the advanced request yeah. is how do you draw that line and how do you define that line? Particularly in the case of, oops, oopsie. Let me see if I can get back to, oh, okay, we're singing. Um, I was, okay, so imagine that slide that's got the middle section where you're not found eligible yet for MAID, but you, that, okay. So, um, you know, I, I guess it depends on where you want to locate the risk, right? So it may be, it's like, like God is, is here, you know, like, oh, the angels. Um, so let's, let's, let's just pull up this, this slide here. Um, it's there. Okay. So this is where there may be a material difference between here and here, right? So here, somebody may have a, have a um, so for example, being eligible for May doesn't mean that you don't have dementia. You can have dementia and be competent to make a treatment decision um, but be, and make a request for MAID as a result of suffering that you're experiencing as a result of, let's say, an advanced cancer, right? So dementia by itself is not... Uh, I would be really worried about seeing it as becoming a criterion for exclusion. It's certainly not the case. And I think it's to your point as well. Somebody can have, um, so with a, a mental disorder, can also have acute episodes of the mental disorder and then have uh, periods of lucidity and competence and clarity, right? So and, and, and I'm seeing this in my own father. Early, yeah, probably didn't want him to do his banking anymore, but he could do a lot of other things. Now, it's a little different, right? So it's sort of a moving target. 
So what we could say, so let's, let's so A, dementia ought not to be an exclusion criterion. Um, and it really speaks to, we care about dementia because of what its effect may be or may have on competence, right? Or ability to make a decision. But in the case of somebody who's already eligible, um, has been found eligible to make, they've made a competent request, and there's a, a period of waiting, and then it would be administered. Um, we might say, well, what are the chances that they might change their mind? Well, you know, let's, let's imagine in, in Mo's case, he's, he's talked about it, he's family supportive, probably not a pretty high risk. And so he is the one who's willing to take that risk of changing his mind, right? In the case, in the second, Vi's case, um, you're right. So how could she describe adequately and help her family understand adequately what it would mean for her to be suffering intolerably? And what does that look like for me? Now, uh, so let me just give two, two sort of examples. And I think sometimes it turns on, there's some philosophical discussion about whether or not, um, you know, if, if somebody becomes, um, is in a state of advanced dementia, if they become an entirely different self, but an entirely different set of interests and preferences and values. In which case, are we killing somebody else? We might see historically, are they killing another, uh, killing a person? And so um, I think there's some, a lot of uncertainty about what the trajectory of, of that disease might be. My dad's a, he's content, he's at home in his long-term care facility. In fact, he's still very much my dad, even though it, he's, he's, it's almost like he's more acutely my dad in certain respects that is no longer masked by other sorts of, you know, sort of social behaviors. He's lovely, absolutely dear. But I was at a CIHR um, review panel meeting. I was sitting outside. I had to recuse myself. So did this other uh, researcher. We were chatting. And her experience, though, completely different with her mom. Her mom, who was a gracious, loving, caring mom, always was very um, supportive of her kids and her daughter, um, daughter, the daughter I was speaking with. Her mother, the trajectory of her illness was that her mother was berating her every visit she went she was, it, her mother was no longer the mother she, she knew, and so, but she, you know, bonds of affection, but she was, const, she was there, it was not her mother's fault. And yet, there is, there was the sense of who is this person, and she's my, so this sort of, this sort of uncertainty, like who is, is this still the person? So, um, but it turns, comes back to this question about who bears that risk? So is the risk really you and I saying, I'm willing to take the risk that, Maybe um, you will misinterpret my wishes, and I will, you know, maybe perhaps I'm happy some days, not so happy other days. And okay, you did your best to interpret this. I've prepared you as well as I can to interpret me at this point, um, as opposed to the risk being seen as the risk of the third party who making that determination. And I think there will be some who will say, I'm willing to take that risk because there is, it doesn't matter what that, what it looks like for me at that point, that's not a state that I want to be in. I'll give you as much detail as I can. Um, and then I leave it up to you and, and I, I grant you permission to maybe get it wrong. But how do you develop policy with that in mind? So you can do that in an individual, but how do you develop policy? I don't know, <laughs> right? That's the work we need to do, right? But, but I guess, yeah, yeah. Yes. One last question. Uh, so in my work as a clinician, I see lots of people uh, in the geriatric population who have a disease that will probably lead to their demise in yes. five or ten years, yeah. um, but they are sort of being medically managed and they're coping. However, it does have a, a very negative effect on their, their mental health, and they often express sentiments of, oh, just let me die, yeah. uh, like I don't want to be a burden, just let me go. And so I'm wondering um, if MAID would ever be eligible for them, or um, ideally, is this being taken as an opportunity in the medical world um, as sort of a, a big sign that this is a patient subgroup that needs to be managed better? Um, so has there been any talk about <coughs> this sort of situation at all? I uh, guess it was... A couple of years ago, I was on a panel. There was um, an international end-of-life care conference, and we were talking about frailty mm -hmm. and uh, seniors with comp multiple conditions. And the the, con the convergence of all of those means, you know, a life you know for some was experienced as suffering, right? And so that suffering is not is real. So um, you know, so the question might be: there are it, it likely one let's see the combination of those disease conditions or one of those disease conditions is likely going to precipitate that individual's death. So they, you know, they might meet the eligibility criteria, foreseeable death, severe and incurable, you know, um, and yet at the same time there's this thing about the suffering which 
seems to be elements of its seem or they invite management some way. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to hear some of how, how the conversations related to um, managing suffering of, frail, uh, of frailty um, are converging with conversations about palliative care, not palliative care as, as a trajectory towards death, but what the competencies associated with managing suffering, addressing suffering that could be built into care of the elderly who are experiencing frailty. Now, now we might say, well, but then are we doing that just so as to avoid their autonomous choice to choose MAID? No, we're addressing the suffering. And it, you know, we're addressing the suffering to the extent that we can. I mean, it in itself is a, is a, is a moral call to us to respond in some way. And where we can, then we, we really ought to respond in some way. Now, it may, be, um, it may not be entirely possible. So my 103-year-old grandmother, who can barely see, has all of her cognitive capacities. Um, I saw her this summer, and she said, you know, I wake up in the morning and I ask myself, why am I still here? Like, what purpose am I serving? Like, and it, not sort of like, what are my tasks? But rather, you know, like, what's my, like, it's more of an existential type of question. Well, that's an interesting question. Is she suffering from that? Yeah, there's an element of suffering from that. Does she want to leave this world? Not yet. You know, so, you know, there are forms of suffering which are moments of reflection for individuals that might lead some to say, yeah, I've got to, I, I've got to leave, and others to say, I've got to say, so that getting it back again, what does this mean for this individual? But uh, there's skills involved with that, right, isn't there? Like, it's like, it's not just, okay, we're going to give you a new, new prescription, we're going to manage your, going to do med rec with you. It's like, yeah, and how, you know, so uh, what gets you up in the morning? What? What was, what was the last really special thing that happened to you? It was a different kind of conversation that is, requires time and a little bit of confidence, too, I imagine, to have that. So anyway, there's so many strands we could go with today. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, well, round of applause, please. Thank you, everybody.